in the image and likeness of God. Well, then you give to God what's made in his likeness and his image. I, th I, think, I think that's a huge teaching point that sometimes we just kind of go over. So what is it? Is it belong to the government? Now, I don't think that you should overpay your taxes. I don't, uh, about two years ago, three years ago, I realized that my nephew, um, who's a, uh, how old is he, 20-something, 20 27, he's a super, super good guy, and uh, he's like, Uncle Mike, just send me your taxes and I'll do them for you. I pay him, by the way, but uh, send me your taxes, I'll do them. And I was like, dude, you, how are you getting me this much money back? He goes, well, it's, it's just the tax laws. And I go, look, I don't believe in poking the bear, so, so could we just back this number down a little bit? Uncle Mike, it's your money. It's, it's okay. I, I'm not doing anything illegal here. This, I was like, hallelujah. Why didn't I use you four years ago? Because you, you probably weren't in business four years ago. Be, be appropriate, but follow the law. Verses 8 and 9 says this. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this scripture gets used a lot for the, you're not supposed to buy anything on credit. But if you look in the context, now I think the Bible clearly says that we're not supposed to be in debt and, and things like that. But, but this scripture in context in context, he's talking about owing people as in, as in being, being at odds with people or, or owing them an apology or owing them, owing them a correction of something that you've done wrong. Because it goes right into talking about um, he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. If any of the other commandments, it is summed up in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So I don't think Paul was saying you should not buy a camel on payments to his people. Um, that's not what he was saying, but he was saying you shouldn't cheat the guy you're buying the camel from. You shouldn't cheat the guy you're selling your camel to. Well, yeah, it's, it's a perfectly good camel. Um, you know, uh, just whatever you do, don't try to ride him until uh, after you've paid me or, or, or something like that. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So owe nothing to anyone except love. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. So I think that's where the balance is. Don't, if you love somebody, you won't owe them love. You won't owe them what you should have done for them out of love. Remember that Jesus was the one who uh, didn't, he, Jesus wasn't the one who said, uh, don't do unto others as you don't want them to do to you. That, that was already around. That had been around for years. That was a, you know, don't do anything to anybody that you don't want them to do to you. But Jesus flipped it on its head and it said, no, do unto others what you'd want them to do to you. So how would you want somebody to treat? And think about, we always think about this in a good light. Well, you know, I would want somebody to bring me flowers. And I, you know, but, but what if you had messed up? What if you had made a mistake at work and you'd cost the company some money? How would you want them to react to you? Well, I'd want them to come and go, well, that's, that's bad, but you know what? We'll, we'll just take the loss and we'll learn from it and we'll move forward. Okay, now, but when you're the one who is the one who's taken the loss, is that how you're going to treat this employee? Is that how you're going to return uh, that? So love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, if you've not read Danny Silk's book on Keep Your Love On, we have copies. I will give you a copy. Because there's a danger with, with, with being loved, with loving people, right? What happens when you're a loving, 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 loving person? Can you get taken advantage of? Yes. And here's the thing. If you have, let's say you have five gallons of love, five gallons of blessing to pour out on somebody, and you have this one person who wants all, they want six gallons, and they will take six gallons. How much love now do you have left to give over to other people? You have nothing left, they've, they've taken it all. And I know that's kind of a weird analogy, but, but you, have the right to, you have the right to distribute your love how you want. Don't let somebody come and take your love, and how do you do that? Well, you set healthy boundaries. You know when to say no, 
so that you have the ability to say yes. If I say yes to everything that happens, and then my wife says, hey, can we go kayaking? Anybody see pictures of me in my new kayak? It's called the Pappy Yak, thank you. I came up with that myself. But if I say yes to everybody else and she says, hey, can we go kayaking? Ah, oh, no, I said yes to everybody else. Because I said yes to everybody else, I have to say no to her. It's better for me to say no to a few people so that I can say yes to her. You control how you distribute your love. So, love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. But you control that. Verse 11, 12. Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than we believed. The night is almost gone, the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. I don't know that I have the absolute answer to this. Some of you probably will. But here's, here's what I'm going to say. Free tacos tomorrow. Have you ever been there? at a restaurant and says, free whatever tomorrow, and you come back tomorrow? They go, yeah, tomorrow. Well, tomorrow never comes. Paul believed in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. If Paul believed it 2,000 years ago, should you and I believe it today? Yes, and we should live as if we believe Jesus is going to come back before we get in our cars to drive to lunch. All the New Testament writers believe that, and we should too. But here's what happens. Well, after I get my business established, then I'll start doing the paperwork the right way. Well, after I've, I've sowed my wild oats, well, then I'll settle down. Well, well, I'll live for Jesus tomorrow when I'm eating those free tacos. That's not what he wants. That's not what he's calling. Paul is encouraging us to live like it's the last day we're going to be here. There is such a different mindset from people who say, if you knew you were going to die tomorrow, what would you do? One of, uh, one of the Peace Hall family favorite movies is Groundhog Day. Uh, we, we try to watch it every Groundhog Day and sometimes in between. If you've anybody seen Groundhog Day with Bill Murray? Bill Murray is a TV uh, a, uh, weather, weather forecaster. He goes to, to interview Poxitani Phil. He's going to see if Poxitani Phil can tell him whether, whether we're going to have more winter or not. And so he gets there, he does the thing, he's really unhappy, he's not a very good guy, and um, he, he does it, it's a horrible day, he goes to sleep. The next morning, the radio goes off, and it's the same exact radio announcer saying the same exact thing, playing the same exact music. He walks downstairs, and everybody's going, oh, are you going to see Pox County Phil? I did that yesterday. And he begins to relive the same day over and over. And it's interesting, at the beginning of it, he, he's like, he's robbing banks. He's, he's, you know, he's messing with people. He's like, ah, well, there's, there's, no pay, there's no payback here. I'm just going to live however I want. But at some point, it turns and he begins to go, look, I've got every day. So he learns to play the piano. He learns to ice sculpt. He learns to skate. He, he, he learns everybody's, everybody in town. He knows their names. He knows their dogs. He knows when this person's going to choke on a piece of meat. It's, it's amazing. His, his, his philosophy goes from how much can I get away with to how much good can I do? How much can I do? Now, I'm, it's not, he's not that good of a guy, but at any rate, if you knew you were going to die tomorrow, it's like, oh, man, I got a whole laundry list of things I've been wanting to do. I want to go over and smack that person, and I, and I want to go steal that, and I want to do this, and I've never done that, but I've always wanted to do that. Or are you thinking, man, there are people I got to tell about Jesus. There are things I've got to do. I, 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 man, if I only have one day left, I got some stuff I want to accomplish for the kingdom. That's what Paul is saying. Don't live as if it's dark and it's always going to be dark. Live for the day. Finally, 13 and 14. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. Live for Jesus, that is all. I, I had a friend one time and he, he called me and he said, you know, I, I, uh, um, I'm going to be separated from my family for a while. 
And I know that when I'm in these situations and I'm lonely, I tend to, uh, I tend to watch things I shouldn't watch. I tend to do things I shouldn't do. So I'm calling you right now because I want you to hold me accountable. I want you to, I want you to check on me because now that I've told you this, I'm going to know Mike knows and Mike's going to ask me about this. And that's the whole thing about having an accountability partner. And uh, what I said to them at that point, I said, that's awesome. I will pray for you. I will, I will check on you. And I'm encouraging you right now to preload the rest of your week. Plan things that will keep you in the right thing, doing the right thing, in the right mind frame, with the right music, with the right people, with the right atmosphere. Just plan. Leave no provision for the flesh. Um, I'll close with this. We, uh, and anytime a pastor says I'll close, you're supposed to go, yeah, right. I really will. The last few uh, days I've been helping a guy, a realtor friend of mine who's bought a, a duplex. He got there, it was advertised as a duplex, only to find out it was a triplex, which was cool for him because that's one more renter that he has that he didn't know he had. And, uh, but, but the person who's owned it up until now has just done a horrible job of maintaining it. Uh, one of the gentlemen who lives there, his name is James, and James has lived there seven years. Um, James pretty much uh, sits in a dark, cold room watching two monitors. One is Law and Order or whatever, whatever YouTube thing he's watching or documentary he's watching. The other is a picture of his front door where he can see who is ever standing at his door. So every time I'm there, he knows I'm there. And uh, James had a dryer that it had, it, it, it was not vented, okay? Do y'all know that your, your dryer is actually supposed to be vented outside, not just into your living space? And uh, as, I was talking to, as I was talking to him, he goes, you suppose that's why I'm sick all the time? <laughs> it, could, it could be part of it. So, um, so anyways, I, I, I've been working with James, and it's amazing, because he's like, man, I'm so tired. I just don't know why I'm tired all the time. It's like, well, dude... You sit on the couch all day and watch TV in the dark. That's why you can't sleep at night. Okay, so, you know, there's that. Uh, make no provision for that, my friend. Get out and do something. Exercise. Make yourself tired. But the big story is uh, that third room, the, tri uh, the triplex that they didn't even know was a, was a room. And uh, I call it Block C, C Block, because it just sounds right to me, and it's a cave. I literally have to use a flashlight. I knock on the door, I use a flashlight, I walk in and I step over stuff, you know, so I can get back to the room that I'm trying to do some repair work. And the guy is just literally laying on the couch in the dark and like, you know, doesn't really communicate at all. Now y'all pray for me because this week I'm going back over there tomorrow morning and I'm just gonna look at him and I go, are you okay? <laughs> can, I, can I help you? Because you seem to be living in the dark. And when I was reading this about living in the dark, that guy came to my mind. I mean, he lives in the dark. Christians, we don't have to live in the dark. We get to live in the light. We get to live in a light that is so bright, it illuminates everything. And we don't go, oh, it's horrible, it illuminates everything. No, no, it's good. It illuminates everything so that the Holy Spirit can help us deal with it because he wants us to live free of all of that stuff that we wouldn't even notice if it was in the dark. So my encouragement to you this week um, uh, isn't just go pay your taxes, but recognize the authority that we live under. It doesn't mean that every, every authority person over us is a godly person. It's not saying that at all. But God is the one who placed them in authority over us. And so we are under their authority because ultimately we're under God's authority. And it's the same in our house. It's the same in our, in our workplace. Um, who is it that God has placed over us in authority? We respect that position because we respect the one who put that person in that position. And then finally, for, for what he says here, for us to, to leave no room for the flesh, just to get our, get our day up together. If you've got, um, uh, my dad is uh, forever, um, the kind of guy who's, he, he would save stuff because he was sure that he would need it again sometime. It's like, Dad, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an electrical code book from the 1800s. I don't think you're ever going to need that again. I think, they've, I think they may have changed things on that. But, but some of us, we keep things in our life that we know it can only serve one purpose. 
That's if I ever want to go back to living that old way, I still have one. Get rid of that. 